Hey folks, how you doing? My name is Manny Veloso, and I'd like to welcome you to the ASQ LED webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about SIPOC and mind mapping, and how really that combines along with a problem statement and objective to get you to a really good project start. Uh, I want to apologize if things aren't perfect yet, because uh, this is my first time as an organizer, so I'm still trying to make sure that I've got the right buttons. Uh, I think we're pretty good here though. So I am um, getting ready to, to get started. So, you know, I think it's very interesting. Um, just a little bit about my background real quick. I've been involved in Lean as well as Six Sigma for a very long time now. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to be in several different situations where companies starting the Lean journey, I uh, was able to get in on the ground floor and really learn all the mistakes, all the things you should or should not be doing um, as you're trying to implement Lean. So um, let's see here. I'm just trying to make sure that everybody's where they need to be. Um, so why are we talking about this? Why is this such a good way to start? Uh, and the short version of this is because it makes a lot of sense. Okay, when we're going through and, and doing these things, um, let me ask you a question. Have you ever fumbled at the start of a project? Have you ever struggled to um, get consensus on what the problem actually is? Have you ever had concerns about what, um, not just the, the problem statement or objective, but also to what process you're actually looking at? And then have you maybe gone down the wrong paths because you're not using uh, all the knowledge of the people in the room or on the project team to help guide these things for you. That's generally the case. Um, if you just do what I've done way too often, you know, in a typical project startup, you just go in there and, and just start talking about things, right? So what we're gonna do with today is really try and show you a structured process on how to do this sort of stuff. And if you'll take a look at the bottom graphic, you'll see, if you have a problem statement and objective, that then can lead you to a high level type of process map known as a side talk. Um, hoping, fairly certain that people are familiar with this. And if not, once you see it, you'll understand. Um, then you get involved, do a mind map, and I have lots of examples of that for you. Uh, and I think when you've done those three things, you will have done a pretty good job of preliminary process investigation. And this is what we think of as uh, all the fine tools in the uh, the Six Sigma world, if you will. Uh, this is even before we start doing series data collection. So we're trying to get to the shared understanding of the, the problem and the environment in which the project takes place. Um, the idea is that very quickly you can get to this fairly deep knowledge and you get a better sense of how to proceed with any investigation. Now, I mentioned Six Sigma earlier. This does not just apply to a Six Sigma project. This really applies to any project that you might be doing or working on. And I think that is actually a fairly big deal. So first, I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about how to define the problem and the goal. And really, the idea is um, that, again, if you think about failure modes for projects, all too often, what happens is um, they're fuzzy or um, over time, perhaps other people's sense, maybe your, your sponsor's sense of what the project is, or leadership sense of the project changes over time. And, uh, you know, you might have signed up to work on one small area or on one machine. And over time, um, somebody thinks that you're actually ending up solving all the problems in a division. Uh, that's one of the things that we try to watch out for. So scope creep can be a big deal in projects. Right, I think of that as chasing butterflies. Uh, after all, just imagine that it's a, a beautiful spring day and there's a bunch of wildflowers in the field. And as you look over that field, you can see a bunch of butterflies flitting from flower to flower. A bunch of kids come up and they think it'd be a lot of fun to start chasing those butterflies. Um, so at the end of the day, they're all red faced and sweaty. And the short answer is they've gotten nowhere. They're still in the middle of that field. So what we're trying to do really is avoid you folks doing those sorts of things uh, and really getting up to speed fairly quickly on your projects. So let's talk for a bit about problem statements. 
Um, and this is sort of funny to me because it's it's not too difficult to make a good one. It's really easy to make a, a bad one, of course. And so here are some shoulds and should nots related to problem statements, right? It should describe how the problem is measured and how bad it is. Um, it should talk about the impact on the business or the customers. And of course it should use real data wherever possible. Uh, what it should not do is state the solution or even what's causing the problem. And you don't wanna focus on, on people. Right, that, that's not a good thing. Of course, in the lean world, we would say that it's the process. It's not about people, it's the process. And that's really what we wanna look at. So if you take a look and evaluate these three problem statements, um, you can take a look. Um, the first one says the printer plate making department is having excess amounts of makeover, which results in budget overruns and overtime. These makeovers can also result in scrapping full production runs of material. Well, this to me is what I think of as a 30 inch snow problem. For instance, I live in Pennsylvania. And um, if somebody were thinking about moving to Pennsylvania and they asked me about the weather, I could look them in the eye and say, you know, it could snow up to 30 inches around here. You know, you should be careful of that. And the reality is, yeah, it did two years ago. And the time before that, when it snowed 30 inches, had been 20 years before that. So while something like that can occur, uh, it doesn't really occur very often, and that's where we want to have data to really shape the discussion. We don't want to know how bad it could get. We want to know how bad it typically is. And um, honestly, I, I look at that first problem statement, and I think my kids wrote it, you know, at least when they were younger. Uh, of course, now they're um, different than that. They're more data-driven. In fact, they're engineers. But the uh, fact of the matter is, when they were younger, they could have written that problem statement. You know, you never listen to me. You always take her side kind of stuff. Um, and that's what that first problem statement looks like. Now, moving on to the second problem statement, um, if you see the printer plate making department over the last three months has experienced a 7.24% makeover rate because of poor handling by the material handlers. So this problem statement is marginally better. It's really not that good. It certainly wouldn't run with it. Um, for one, which last three months are we talking about? Um, also, too, it points the finger at um, the, the material handlers, which is presupposing a lot of things that we don't know or else we wouldn't be doing a project. The other thing I don't like about this is the unnecessary precision uh, in the percentage, right? 7.24%, uh, I, I don't know. It's I just don't think it's necessary. I prefer to say 7.2%. That lets me know that um, whoever's telling me this has actually seen um, and done, seen the data, done the math um, without the unnecessary precision. This looks to me like somebody failed to change the defaults in Excel and they're reporting things that just aren't necessary. So take a look at the third problem statement. And here we have a very specific time frame. We still have that annoying 7.24%, the unnecessary precision in the percentage. Um, it does give us a target of zero, and it results in an annualized cost of poor quality estimated at 370,000%. I mean, of course, the funny thing about that is cost of poor quality uh, is typically represented by an iceberg where only 10% is known, 90% of it is hidden. We tend to think of the cost of poor quality as being material, labor, and overhead, but really it can be a lot more than that. You know, think about the last customer crisis that, that you had to deal with. How many meetings were involved? Um, I've been in situations where the customer gets so concerned that we have to have regular daily updates on what we're doing to solve the problem. Um, that costs money. You know, think about the travel that you might have to do out there either to fix things or to uh, at least fix your reputation with the customer. That also costs money. Think about the opportunity costs of all the things you could be doing if you weren't doing um, this, this um, rework or um, public relations uh, repairing of your reputation uh, and establishing, reestablishing customer confidence. So if you take a look at these three problem statements, I think the last one is the one that comes closest to being objective and um, being a, a reasonable description of the problem and the impact on the business 
and not to mention the cost story. So if you remember from a kid of Mad Libs, here is a Mad Libs problem statement that you can use. And this really uh, is just the, the facts, the basics, the minimum that you'd want to put into your own problem statement. If you take a look at it, it covers all the things that were in our third problem statement, the period of time, this thing that we're measuring, that's our barometer of if we're doing okay or not okay. Um, that metric is also what we're going to use to tell when we're making changes that are going to have a good impact versus a not so uh, good impact. You know, obviously when you make changes, you hope that they drive the metric that you're tracking in the direction of goodness. You don't know that until you actually get a chance to measure, see the progress, and then decide if you need to change direction slightly or perhaps um, completely change your approach to fixing the problem. Uh, also, too, putting the worth of the, this problem, the gap, um, is really what starts to get senior leadership especially excited. You know, it's nice to say, yeah, we reduced strap by 2% last year. Uh, in some of the management meetings I've been in, that earns you a golf clap. You know, yay, good job. But if you said, hey, we reduced the cost of scrap in the organization by $160,000, uh, hard dollars, that is, then, then all of a sudden people start sitting up in their chairs and paying attention to what you're talking about. And that really is important because we want the hard work of the project team to be recognized and their contribution to the health of the organization to be acknowledged. I think that's really important. Equally important when you're starting your project is this idea of developing a problem objective. And what it really should do is describe the goal of the project, what it is that you're trying to do. And a lot of times when we talk about problems, projects, objectives, um, we refer to some of them as boiling the ocean. And what we mean by that is that we're really just trying to accomplish way too much at one time. Um, and it's just really impossible. And what we have to do is break up this thing that we're trying to work on into manageable bites. And that takes a little bit of experience to do, to know what a manageable bite is. However, we can certainly be clear about what we're doing. And in that way, um, if, if somebody in senior leadership with more experience or somebody else with more experience knows that, oh, you know, you're really trying to do too much at one time with this project objective, um, then we can specifically talk to the facts that are on paper. So what should a project objective do? It should specifically describe the goal of what we're trying to do. Okay. Uh, one of the things I tell my groups is, you know, you, you can't get up off the couch and just run a marathon first thing, right? You have to build your way up to it. Likewise, if somebody were to come to me and say, oh, Manny, you know, I'm going to take this cost of scrap that's 12% and I'm going to drive it down to zero in the next month, I would think that they didn't really understand their problem. Um, perhaps you've seen things like that. And I'm sure some of the folks watching this webinar um, are involved in coaching people on a daily basis and see these sorts of things, right? We all want to solve a problem. We all want to hit home runs that win ball games. But the reality is, it's the small daily incremental wins, the improvements that we make in our processes that actually win ball games, right? Just ask any baseball fan. You know, we all love the home run derby um, that takes place before the All-Star game, right? It's exciting to see these, these powerful hitters launching balls into the, the stands. But the reality is, on a day-to-day -day basis across a 162-game season, what really wins ball games is base hits, not stranding runners, and paying attention to the basics. So that's what we're trying to do here. Um, likewise, the project objective should say when you plan to be done, and it should use real data as much as possible. One of the things that I tell in the people in my classes is, if you don't know what the hard numbers are, if you're trying to reduce scrap or increase productivity or reduce cycle times, you don't know the numbers of where you should be, then just put in an XX into your problem statement or objective as a placeholder so that when you do get that information, you can go back and update it. Obviously, speaking of which, a problem statement and objective are their living documents, if you will, um, whether or not they're part of any project charter or A3 or anything else. And they can and should change 
as new facts come to life as processes change. So what shouldn't a project objective do? Well, it should never state the solution or uh, place blame on individuals. Um, final point, be aggressive. You know, we all want to be able to um, say what we're going to do and then meet that objective, but, you know, sort of the, the, the saying can be swing big, hit big. Um, and if you miss, as long as you didn't miss completely, you've still made significant progress towards your objective. So let's take a look at these project objectives and see what you think. So the first one, the goal of the project is to never have rework ever again in the printer plate making department by December 31st of this year. Well, there again, you could say that my kids, as kids, could have written that statement because that's just really unrealistic. Um, it's just, that's, that, that's not even real. If somebody brought that to me in a business context, um, I would tell them to go back and think about it really and see how often they've ever been able to do stuff like that with other problems or projects uh, and then come back to me when they had something better. The second one, you take a look, the goal is to reduce the makeover rate from 7.24% to 7.0%. Okay, well, there's a, a case of underachieving, right? We always want to meet the goals that we state, but in this case, we're really not trying very hard and 7% is still presumably a significant business challenge that needs to be overcome. The other piece of that problem statement, of course, is that it's signaling exactly what's going to happen. Um, you know, we're going to retrain all the operators. And of course, anybody who spent more than three minutes reading or learning about root cause knows that if the answer to your kappa is that we retrained the operator on the proper procedure, that that response did not get to root cause, right? It's all about the process. What can we do? What can we change in order to make that work? Uh, of course, the last one is a bit more realistic. By December of this year, the goal is to reduce the makeover rate from seven and a quarter percent to seven point, or sorry, to one percent. Okay, that's pretty significant. Um, and chances are good it's not just one thing that we need to do to fix that. It's a series of issues that all contribute to that uh, greater than 7% makeover rate. So here again, a Mad Libs project template for your objective. Um, many times I see that people want to add more information, and that's fine, either to the problem statement or the objective. I don't have any problem with that. But I do say that they really need to um, have at least this minimum amount of information so that we understand what's going on and so that um, the team is focused, so that the organization understands what to expect out of this project and really to help guard against scope creep. And one of the things that I always tell my folks to do is when you've got a problem statement and objective, write them down, put them up on a whiteboard, or better yet, on a flip chart that you can bring into the conference room every time you're having a team meeting. And that way, whenever the conversation starts to talk about different things that you might do or areas to investigate or explore, you can always compare those proposed actions back to the problem statement and objective and see if we're actually fulfilling that objective or if we're actually starting to get out of scope, which is incredibly easy to do. So we want to avoid that. Um, a tool that's going to help us with that is this idea of a SIPOC. So we're going to talk a little bit about what a SIPOC is and some of the major components of a SIPOC. Um, I actually have created an appendix that talks more about what SIPOC is and gives a little bit more information about some of the other pieces. We're going to spend time talking about the process. Uh, part of a SIPOC because that really is the, the idea of um, helping to prevent scope creep. So, so let's talk. What is a SIPOC? Well, real simply, a SIPOC is a high-level process map. And you can see on the slide, this is the template that I like to use the most. There are many templates out there. They all contain similar things. Um, some have more detail than others. Um, I like this one because you can see the, the five blocks for the process itself, 
they're laid out in proper order. Uh, it's visual. I've seen other SIPOC templates where you're just listing um, a, a brief description of the process, sort of literally down the page. And I find that I'm a visual person like many people are. And so I, I prefer this one. It's simple, it's clean, it's easy to fill out. Rule of thumb, if it takes you more than about 10 minutes to fill out your SIPOC, either by yourself or with a team, then you're probably overthinking it or you're on the wrong track. So, so why is a SIPOC any different from any other tool that we use in the CI world? Short version is it gives us a starting point for investigation on starting to break down the process. Even if I'm going to do a value stream map, with a group of people, I like to start with a SIPOC because to me, what it allows you to do is to keep track of the big picture and the purpose of why this process exists without getting lost in the details. You know, it's funny, every time somebody tells me, oh man, you know, I was involved in a process map or value stream map and we had post-it notes covering three walls you know, they're all proud of that fact. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm really sorry you wasted all that time detailing lots of steps that, that aren't really the problem. The way I think of a sidecock is uh, in some of the, the national forests, every so often above the canopy of the tree line, you'll see these towers. Uh, they're fire watching stations. And to me, a sidecock is a tool much like a, a fire watching station. It allows you to survey the entire forest and then say, hey, there's a problem in that southeast corner. I'd better go check it out. So the way I use a SIPOC in investigating processes is we'll start with the first block and we'll say, okay, is this step a problem? Does it cause problems? Is it a problem to actually accomplish the purpose of this step? No. Great. Let's move on to the next one. How about that one? No. Uh, how about the third one? And that's when people light up and say, yeah, that's where we see the problems. It's not so much in entering orders, it's in scheduling, or it's when we're checking inventory or whatever your issue is. So let me show you an example of a side pocket. Hopefully it will start to make more sense. Uh, also to give you a little bit of guidance about when you should be using a side pocket. And the reality is in my mind, after you do a problem statement and objective, that would be a great time to do a side pocket so that people can really understand what's going on. Um, the idea is too by building this as a group everybody understands the problem the same way and i think that's important also too, keep in mind that the first and last process box boxes are what define the scope of your project so this is a very practical tool to help eliminate scope creep and i think that's really important so we're talking about how to make these things work. Um, it really, for me, a lot of times starts with a process. I mean, ideally, when you're solving problems, you would actually have the end customer in mind, but the reality, at least for, for most of my investigations throughout my career, is that I was given a process and then said, okay, here, go fix it. So a lot of times we start with the process and it's really intended to be this high level view. Um, and we're looking at, steps that, that can be done completely. Perhaps it takes two or three people to enter an order for various reasons. Maybe you're checking credit, you're, uh, you're, you're entering things, somebody's looking at the schedule. But in my mind, order entry would be a block. Okay, scheduling would be a block. And then production would be a block. And then depending on how far down the process we're going, we might stop with uh, test and pack. We might stop with ship. Or we might stop with invoicing, depending again on the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, anything beyond those blocks is what's considered to be out of scope. Now, SIPOC is also a living document, and therefore, um, as information comes up, as needs change, either of the customer, the business, uh, or whatever, we need to be able to change the SIPOC to reflect the reality that we've got. So, does a few great things, right? I mean, it's well spent time because we get to define the scope of the project. So we know when we're out of bounds. And also too, everybody has the shared understanding when they build it. So it's very cool. So here are a couple of examples of a process 
that might fit on a side pod. And in fact, has. First one is obviously a transactional process that we're looking at. And you can see um, the, the, the clock starts or the process starts when we receive the mortgage application. Actually, it's kind of funny because uh, I was just working with a bank this week and they were asking similar things. Hey, we get loan requests. And that, that was one of the reasons why we were together trying to work on loan requests. And they said, some people here in the bank think that we ought to start from the time we get an inquiry from um, an applicant. And they said, other people think that we should be starting later in the process. And as they were describing this to me, they were saying, you know what happens? Okay, somebody wants to uh, buy a property, perhaps, maybe an investment property. So <clears throat> they get the information about the loan, about our process, about how all that works. And then they go off and maybe it takes them six months to find a suitable property that they can bring to us that we can then evaluate for the, the worth of the loan, you know, so that they, they know. Um, and said so some people want to measure from that first contact from the applicant. And I said, well, you know, I got to tell you guys, it's, it's one of those things that's not controllable by you. So if you're measuring it, why are you measuring it? And if the answer is to see how long it takes an applicant to get from initial inquiry to processing a loan or to, to receiving a check, and ask them, what are you going to do with that information? Because so much of that upfront part of the process is beyond your control. You can't do anything with it. Instead, think about what you do control, and that is when they come back to you and say, hey, Mr. Lender or Mrs. Lender, I found a property that I would like to apply for a mortgage on. I said, now all that stuff is, is within your facility. It's within your control, so to speak. And that is worth measuring. I said, I mean, you might want to see how long it takes uh, people typically from an, an initial application or initial inquiry about a loan to the time it closes. But really, so much of that is beyond anything that you can control. Focus on the things that you can do. And they thought about it and really seemed to like that advice. And, and I saw lots of people writing things furiously and making plans to go back and talk to other folks about it. So, you know, that was good. Um, take a look at the second process here. In this case, this is more of a manufacturing process. Um, now, it's interesting because depending on the position that you're looking in and what causes creates value, you could argue that all this is set up for something else to be done, in this case, printing. But if you think about the people who are actually creating the plates to use, this is their value-added activity. And so we're looking at, we pull the film for the print job and we end when the plates are loaded onto the press. So there's a lot of pre-press work going on here, uh, but we're not worrying about inks. We're not worrying about registration. We're not worrying about any of those sorts of things. We're just worried about creating plates, getting them ready for use and making sure that they are available at the press. So again, if we were to talk about anything upstream or downstream of that, and you're out of scope. And that's why this is so incredibly helpful. So here's an example. Now, in this case, we're looking at incoming material. Now, notice just based on the way these process steps are marked, you can see what the project is focused on. Okay, after all, materials delivered, QA reviews the documents, product is released. Um, but of course, released in this case for this project didn't mean that it's available for use. It means that it, it's recognized as being in the system, but still on quality hold until the incoming quality folks can review it, um, sign off on it, and then it's, it's released for use to production. Okay, so if you look at what this says, notice we're not focused on the process of delivering the material or the fact that, that maybe it gets placed in the wrong spot. We're really looking at the, the document review and approval so that this material is released uh, for production. And this was in a medical device environment, in fact. So taking a look at it, you can now see some of the key inputs into the process. Uh, very simply, we're talking about raw materials, inspection documents, what this is missing too is the SOPs that the 
IQC people would use. Wow, there's a lot of acronyms there. So basically the procedures that the incoming quality people follow. Who are the suppliers of those inputs? And then we can take a look at the outputs of those of this process. In this case, we're looking at some inspected raw materials. We're looking at completed inspection documents. Um, and then who the customers of, of some of these outputs are. And this helps frame our project the way we're looking at it. You know, it's almost like um, if I were having a conversation with you and I said, well, you know, um, I really want to focus on that inventory problem. You might be asking yourself, well, Manny, what inventory problem are you talking about? Are you talking about the fact that we don't get things when we need them? Are you talking about the fact that we lose inventory once it hits our dock? Are you talking about the fact that we've got way too much obsolete material stored in our warehouse and therefore we don't have room for the things that we really do need? What aspect of this inventory problem are you talking about? And a SIPOC is going to help you see that. Uh, much like the story of the blind man and the elephant, right? You know, an elephant, or sorry, an elephant was brought in front of a group of, of blind people. One person touches the side, oh, an elephant's like a wall. Another one touches the leg, oh, an elephant is like a tree. Uh, another one touches the ear, oh, an elephant is like a, you know, it's like a tree with its leaves. And the idea behind this is that having a good side pocket lets us see which aspect of that elephant that we're interested in. So now, once you've got a problem statement and objective, you've started to pop the hood on your process through a side pocket and you understand some of the, the critical inputs and outputs. You understand the major process steps that you're focused on. Now we get to look at a mind map. Okay, and mind mapping is very cool. Uh, it's really one of my favorite topics. I tend to use it just about every time I'm in front of a group. Uh, we can use it for lots of things. We can use it to look at the, the limits of knowledge. We can look at, I've done uh, mind maps on the technology that's uh, involved in a facility. Um, I've done them to help plan projects out. I've also used them as a substitute for fishbone diagrams when it comes to looking at root cause. Okay, and it's funny because no matter how many times I've taught these topics, fish bones and mind maps, I still can't predict when somebody wants a um, wants to use or prefers to use a fish bone diagram with its structure and the six ends, or they prefer the free form of a mind map. So let's show, let's talk a little bit more about what a mind map actually is. And here's an example on the right there you can see. Okay. And a lot of these are for, in fact, starting up projects. So what is a mind map? It's really a brainstorming tool that involves an entire group. And it follows a very natural and human way of thinking. So I really like it. I get very excited when I see these things, um, especially so when I'm building them because um, I've done it with groups of 20 to 25 people in a room. Maybe I'm the person with the, the flip chart marker drawing the this mind map and yet whenever i get feedback from the people at the end hey did you feel engaged with this even though i was the one doing the drawing they inevitably say yes and it was great because um we all heard the same things we all saw the same things and of course you probably know about different styles of learning that's really helpful so i'm going to go through the, the slides in this section fairly quickly because um i think that's my maps are visual and I don't really need to explain every detail of every technical. What I really like about it though is this last bullet point here, the idea that shows the relationship of the parts to the whole. And that's really important, especially if this is uh, a new process or a new problem that you're investigating. It's sometimes hard to see where what you're talking about fits into the larger picture of the organization. This can certainly help you. So, um, you would typically use these if you're trying to speed up your learning. And I find that, that I certainly can understand a complex topic faster by using a mind map than by reading a lot of words, a lot of documentation to try to understand what's happening. Uh, when you're trying to work with other people, it's really great to get to that shared understanding of the topic. And if you're trying to understand that complicated system, we get to see the relationship of 
one piece of it to another. Now this here, folks, um, is what I think of as a Martha Stewart map, okay? I, for one, am no great artist. I could never hope to build something so cute or so good looking, so color coordinated. And in fact, I'm not convinced that it actually helps in terms of understanding. Um, if this works for you, I think that's great. Um, but my mind maps tend to be simpler, but for me at least, they tend to be equally effective. Here's another example of a mind map. Okay, in this case, you can see somebody was working on a project um, looking at why we get leaks coming from molding. All right, so you can see this is actually part of a larger investigation. Why do we get leaks? Well, you get leaks, leaks for lots of reasons. In this case, this project was focused strictly on the leakers that occur during the molding part of the overall process. So you can see on the left, the one that was done on the board, um, it's nice and colorful, the colors indicate subtopics, um, but that's sort of impractical to, to do a lot with after you've generated these ideas. So a lot of people will transfer them into software. And you can see those two right there. I have to tell you, for me, I prefer the one on the left because it, it feels more natural. And when I'm seeing this, I can remember what it was like to build it. So scratching that kinesthetic part of my personality as well. And uh, it just helps me. They both have their place, but really in my mind, you draw it by hand with a group. And then if you must, then you transfer it into software. And there is freeware there out there that you can look up. These are just a, a few that I've seen. There are many of them out there. And of course, you can always use Visio or Excel if you have nothing else. Um, and that will work for you. So here's another example of uh, a mind map. Now, this this indeed come out of a Six Sigma project, but it really doesn't matter. It just it is, it's any sort of project when you're trying to get below the, the problem everybody's talking about, when you're trying to understand what's happening, you can then see this. And we usually start with a central idea. Um, then we have subtopics that are in, in the circles out on the sides. And then we even have the details of the subtopic. And, and it just helps give us this naturally flowing hierarchy that really helps. Take a look at this one. This, this is a, a map that I did when I was working with an organization and they were trying to generate, they were trying to get a new ERP system and they had to figure out how each part of the organization interacted with the ERP system and really what reports they wanted out of it. So we drew this whole big mind map of which you can see a certain piece of the inset. Um, and then after we were done with this exercise, we wrote up all the requirements into a document, handed it off to the ERP consultant and said, this is what we want. And her response was, wow, this is really the, the most complete set of requirements I have ever seen. Now, um, that, that was a pretty powerful statement to me and it stuck with me. Here's a mind map for an organization that was drawn on a flip chart. And word of warning here, folks, if you draw a mind map on a flip chart, I promise you they're all going to look like this. You start off in the center, and then where do you go? You go into the corners, and that's all you have. What you need with a mind map really is the width of the piece of paper. So if you are stuck doing this on a flip chart, at least take the, the flip chart, pull it, turn it on its side, and then draw it. And I think you'll find it's much better. So um, you can use it, again, to find out root causes of things. Um, and in this case, what we're doing is we're identifying potential root causes that we then may have to go and investigate to, to uh, rule them in or out as, as potential issues that we need to work on. But works really well for that. I think it's a very natural way of, of investigating things. Uh, here's another example. In this case, somebody wanted to investigate viscosity. And in fact, some of the background on this project was quite simply that um, perhaps you, you've heard this before. Um, the problem was that production would go through and they would create this paste. In this case, this is a solder paste for uh, electronics uh, as well as for solar cells. So production would go through, they would formulate a paste, they would get the right viscosity, which is a huge uh, property for, for these folks. They would then submit a sample to the lab 
and the lab would have a different opinion on the viscosity. So what we were trying to do here was uh, rationalize the values of the viscosity, uh, the way we measure it, so that when production thought they had it right, that uh, the, the QC lab would agree with that. And so this was the start of that project. Um, you can use it for things like selling a house. And this is pretty interesting because this is something that people typically don't do all that often. And probably when you're talking to somebody about selling a house, I'm going to give you advice on one or two of these, these subtopics here. But if you take a look, there are so many things to consider, even many more than are here, but this really gets to be quite elaborate. If you can take a look, hopefully you can read some of the subtopics. If not, I've listed some of them on the side. You know, we've got to think about uh, a realtor and the interactions and decisions that occur with, with that person. We've got to think about, well, what are we going to do with our stuff? Where are we going to put it? Um, what's involved with staging the house? And this could include um, repairs and removing, you know, personal items from the house. Anybody who sold a house before really understands what I'm talking about here. And there's an incredible amount of stuff here. Okay, then there, you could actually even have a, a subtopic related to closing day um, for moving some of the considerations, things with starting up the new house. You know, how do we transfer over all of the addresses uh, and all of the services that we need? So, you know, a mind map is really just going to help you with those sorts of things. I think it's pretty cool. Here's one. This was actually drawn by a graphic artist, and, and you can actually see the person's signature in the corner, right? Gorgeous map. It's a really gorgeous map. Um, and this is related to the factors affecting downtime to six amps. My problem with the map is it's so cute and it's so pretty that really every time I look at it, even now, I lose track of the factors that I need to be paying attention to because I'm just so impressed by um, the different things, you know, the, the details of the machine, the, the rain involved with Mother Nature, and, and so on. It's just, you know, art has its place. It definitely does. It doesn't occur in my mind maps because I find it gets in the way of things. Uh, here's one again, fairly interesting. Um, this one sort of goes against the grain. I said that there's a central topic in the center. With this one, I was doing um, a, a lean certification series, and the gentleman who drew this is a CPA and owner of a company. And he said, Hey, Manny, I have this idea for a mind map. What do you think? And I said, Hey, listen, go for it. Let's see what happens. Um, the reason it came about was because he said, listen, when I have discussions with my department heads about costs and expenses, he says, you know, for some of them, their eyes glaze over. For the others, they get really nervous. They don't seem to understand this stuff. Of course, this guy was a CPA, been doing it for a long time. So it was like mother's milk to him. He, he knew the stuff inside, outside, backwards and forwards. Uh, and I know when I've gotten involved in, in accounting and finance, that companies typically have pages and pages and pages of GL codes, okay? And of course the codes are all meaningful, including what the category is of the expense, as well as what department it belongs to. Um, I really believe though that with this mind map, if you had a list of department numbers, maybe a little bit more information too, but if you had this list of department numbers, you could look at an invoice and really decide at least what category it belongs in and therefore, the chances of miscoding something, I think, would be significantly reduced. Plus, think about the understanding of the overall picture. Now we can see it. You can't see this from pages and pages and pages of account numbers. So I, mean, I think there's some real value here. Uh, here's another type of a mind map, too. This actually is from a poster that gets updated every year by this gentleman. Um, it's death and taxes, and, and it relates to uh, US, this piece represents the U.S. government revenue and expenses. And what's neat about it is, even though it's not freeform like the others, um, the size of the bubbles that are coming off the penny are related to the expenditures associated with each one of these departments. And much like a Pareto chart, it gives you a visual of how much is used or consumed by different departments and gives you a, a better understanding of things. I think it's very cool. So here's the idea, folks. 
what I want you to do is to be able to develop a mind map. I want you to see this bigger view uh, at the critical time, which is when you're starting your project so you don't go in the wrong direction. Um, a mind map alone is good, as, as some people might say, necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and therefore, I want you to be able to see what's going on here. Uh, if you take a look at the graphic at the bottom, you want to start off a project the right way, create a problem statement and objectives, hopefully together as a team. Second step, work on a sign pop. Third step, work on a mind map. And after you've done those three sets of activities, I think you're really going to find that you understand very well what is going on with the project and you have a really good idea of next steps. And isn't that so funny? Um, have you ever sat in a conference room with a team looking at each other with that, that sort of dreaded look on your face saying, uh, okay, we've been assigned with this task. I don't really know where to start. Believe me, if you do these things, you will have a much better idea of what it is that you need to do in order to be successful. So that really is um, my presentation here, folks. Now, I told you that I'm relatively new at doing this. I'm going to see if I can take some questions here. Um, I'm not even sure if I can access it. So I might be promising things that I can't quite commit to. Um, I will tell you what though, folks, if, you know what, I'm not even gonna try. Here's what I'm gonna do though. Here's my email address. If you have any questions, then you can feel free to email me and, and I will respond to it directly. Um, if you like that template, I can certainly provide a copy of that. And uh, as always, I'm interested in the feedback that you have on this presentation. Um, I would like to thank Ellen Ermer, uh, who, who um, helped get me involved in, in doing this and coming up with the idea for not just mind maps, but even why we'd want to do that. Um, and I think that I'm done. So even though I'm a few minutes early than my allotted time, I think I'm going to give you back 10 minutes of your day, folks. Okay. I thank you, those that, that, that joined in and um, really wish you good luck with the rest of your day. And again, reach out to me if you have any questions or you want information or you'd like to get a copy of anything that you've seen here. Okay, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now.